Irv Newman, director of the JCC from 1954 until about 1962. And during that time, he also served as a lay leader for the Jewish community prior to the founding of Rota Shalom. It was just the Jewish Community Center here, of which Irv Newman was the director. Irv had a wonderful, still has, I guess, a wonderful yeshiva background. Uh, he had a pleasant voice. He knew how to daven the old-fashioned way. And uh, he also knew how to give a good, a decent sermon in English, at least a decent commentary on the Torah portion each week. And so um, they had those kinds of services before Congregation Road of Shalom was formed. Before I came, Max Simpson did, and after I came, I conducted the services. So you, you were the, in, in a sense, the a rabbi? religious leader. I was not a rabbi, but I was... But yeah, you I did services. I did services. I did funerals. I even did some weddings, which I don't do anymore. When we started, we, they were the regular complement of organizations that met there, B'nai B'rith, B'nai B'rith Women, Council of Jewish Women, Hadassah. We had services every Friday night and Shabbos morning. We conducted all holiday services, a nice Sunday school. Indeed, when I came there, the Sheriff Israel in San Francisco, the synagogue, who used to run the Sunday school, now no longer ran it. And we had it to do ourselves, which we did. We immediately started a day camp. And I drove the truck or the bus for the day camp. I picked up from Sausalito and Mill Valley. There was a family or two of the Dorrensons from Larkspur, uh, Corte Madera, and uh, San Anselmo. It was great. The second year we ran a junior day camp. And then the third year we started a nursery school. The nursery school started in 1954, and it was started by Elizabeth Heaven Street. In 1955, Doc Margoliash and a committee started an art uh, exhibit. And then they felt it was time to start a congregation. Now, uh, the board of directors, when I first came, Max Gottlieb was the president and Julie Gosliner was the vice president, and on the board was Abe Blumenfeld and Dave Cohen, and uh, Dave Rosenberg was, uh, had become a president too after three years, and um, Schwartz, Sidney Rudy was on the board. Uh, really, it was a great board. And uh, they put together, a, I remember, the uh, cocktail party at Harry Albert's house. And they raised about 40% of the, in one afternoon cocktail party, 40% for that new building. And they built a new building with the idea that it would serve both a congregation for holidays, for bar mitzvahs, for events, as well as be a nice auditorium. And... Uh, they went to work and built it, and everybody was active. They did a lot of the work there. After three years, they formed Rodef Shalom when that new building was built, and Rodef Shalom then got a rabbi, and the first rabbi that we got was uh, uh, Julius Liebert. Right. He was a part-time man. He lived in San Anselmo. He was a chaplain at San Quentin. He had been a chaplain in the Army or in the Air Corps. And so he was a part-time rabbi, and he, they had him for about a year, a year and a half. And the rabbi, then Rabbi Morton Hoffman came, and he was the first full-time person that they had there. And I resigned because I had bought a piece of property and was going into partnership to run a camp. My beginnings with Rosh date back to 1957. I was invited to come out in March of 1957 to interview for the uh, open position of rabbi. Uh, I would be the first full-time rabbi of Congregation Rode of Shalom. The interviewing was being done by a committee, the basic committee, 
uh, founders of the congregation plus a few of their friends whom, whom they thought had special expertise. We met, as a matter of fact, for the interview over at uh, Becky Abel's house uh, after they took me out to dinner. And we sat down and we just, they asked me a lot of questions and we chatted. And uh, they were concerned at the time that the rabbi should be somebody who would be able to conduct uh, services with both a, a reform and a conservative um, flavor to it. Uh, they wanted, in other words, a liberal rabbi, a modern rabbi, but one who had trained in a traditional background. I go all the way back to having started out as an orthodox boychik and uh, went to cheder and went to yeshiva and until I rebelled sometime after my bar mitzvah and, and didn't want to be orthodox anymore. But I knew the orthodox tradition. Where uh, was that? that you grew I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. There was a wonderful Jewish community of 100,000 Jews in Cleveland. And I would say that at that time, at least 50 to 60 percent of them were orthodox, traditional Jews. Uh, so uh, I was very familiar with uh, the traditional Sidur, out of which I had davened all my life. And I was, of course, familiar with the uh, Union Prayer Book, which we used in those days. So it was a good shidduch for me, and I think a good shidduch for them. But uh, we entered upon a fundraising campaign in about late 59 or early 60. So you were actively fundraising? I mean, oh, yeah. I, I personally, for instance, went into Harry Albert's office. And I said, Harry, <clears throat> everybody knows you're a financial leader in this community. Uh, we really need to have you make the pace-setting gift to this building fund. And uh, Harry, God bless him, <laughs> had never been confronted uh, with this kind of thing. And uh, he was not thrilled, <laughs> but, but he took it with good humor. <laughs> uh, I remember he got on the phone and he called Abe Blumenfeld and he said, Abe, how much are you going to give to this building campaign? And Abe told him 15000 uh, Abe was part of our building campaign committee, so Abe kind of had prepared himself for it and decided it would be 15000 I said, well, Harry, if Abe is giving 15000 then you have to give at least 20000 And by God, Harry came through. He said, okay, Rabbi, 20000 it is. <laughs> uh, we had a groundbreaking ceremony sometime in uh, 19, late 1961, I think, autumn of 61, and by May of 62, the building was finished. We moved into the uh, new building on May 1st of 1962. The great thing that happened was that uh, a young woman by the name of Elsie Goldman and her, and her family, that is her husband George, and her kids, Abby and Freddie, they moved into the community just a year after I did, 1958. And uh, Elsie had a background of singing in choirs in synagogues back home in Philadelphia, as I recall. So she knew some Jewish music. She had a lovely voice, played the piano marvelously, and we had an organist, Doris Goldberg, at that time, Larry Goldberg's wife. And uh, so we put on musical um, performances, not just for services. We sang, of course, every Friday evening and when we had uh, bar mitzvah services on Saturday morning. We did not have a regular Saturday morning service. We had a Saturday morning service only when there was a bar or bat mitzvah uh -huh. in those early days. Elsie and I became a cantorial team. Uh, there were certain things that, we would, that she would sing. Uh, there were other things that I would sing solo. And there were many things that we sang together as duets or as responses to one another. I really spent um, my last years here with one foot here and, and well, two feet here, but my heart in Israel. <laughs> and uh, made many trips to Israel during those years to scope it out, to uh, interview for potential jobs in Israel. I, I took my summer vacations doing that in both, I think, both 68 and 69. And uh, eventually, uh, we decided to make the move. And what, what year is that? In June of 1970, we moved to Israel. 
started with the synagogue, that is Rodok Shalom, that particular summer, the summer of uh, 1970, and was there until January of 1977 when Rabbi Berenbaum uh, succeeded me. I think um, those years were transitional years. Uh, they were years when we uh, had a lot of young youngsters, young people in the religious school. Uh, we were just developing our youth program. Uh, that, I think, was one of my accomplishments, along with Rabbi Brian Lurie beginning the, uh, the Israel summer program. As I mentioned, I think the synagogue was in transition. Rabbi Hoffman had been uh, in the congregation for 13 years. He was uh, literally the builder of, of buildings. When I came, it was, I think, uh, a time to build programs. Our services, uh, these were the years of rock and jazz services, bringing guitars into the uh, temple. Again, no one, uh, today you can go and see the cantor uh, uh, play the guitar. In those days, that was considered to be uh, radical. Uh, to do that kind of thing. So these, this was a period of time where we were making changes. Uh, some people resisted change. Some people were comfortable with it. Uh, we also, in those days, I think, were struggling to have an identity, how liberal we were going to be, how traditional we were going to be. Uh, that was an issue which uh, 25 years ago we had to work through. And happy birthday, Roto Shalom. the most important event that, uh, that we've had in this congregation was, uh, were in the years between 1985 and 1991 when we broke down the barriers of, of territorial boundaries and, and decided to join with, with the JCC and Grand Isla Bay School and, uh, and offer really to, to everyone in the community an opportunity to come and, um, and share in the building of the campus because I think that this really has had uh, the greatest impact uh, on the community, not just the campus itself, but uh, on each one of us and our abilities to serve the community better. And I would say that that was probably the outstanding um, singular uh, event. I would say the other things that have really, uh, events that have enriched the congregation have been uh, the addition of uh, the kinds of professionals that we've had uh, uh, working here at Rosh Shalom, the, the rabbis who've come to work here over the course of the years, uh, the ones of most recent memory, uh, Robert Dam and, and, and Stacy Levison, uh, whom everyone remembers, but also Lee Bicell, our first uh, associate rabbi, and, and Mimi Beitch, um, brought enormous uh, variety to the congregation. and, and uh, and also the, the addition of professional cantorate at the congregation. Stephen Pizzarni and uh, Rita Glassman and finally David Margulies, who is this just wonderful soul in the, in the life of the congregation. The truth of the matter is that number one, Elsie Krenitsky, who's been at this congregation for 40 years, um, had, always has given the congregation a legacy of good music. For the first more than 20 years of the congregation, she was the soul of its music. And, uh, and when it came time to get full-time professional cantors, um, I did myself work to try to find the funding so that these musical programs would be possible. And, and uh, thanks to the Kirshner family, we have a source uh, to, to put on big musical programs. Many of us come to the synagogue, maybe Friday nights, uh, maybe sometimes Saturday for high holidays, but many of us are never here during the weekdays. Would you tell us what it's like during the week here at, at, at the campus and at the, at the synagogue? Here, there's life all the time. Uh, there are people all the time. There's 200 people or so at Brandeis, Hill all day school, teaching and, and studying. There's uh, early childhood education and daycare uh, in, in the JCC that has another 200 people who are working and kids who are around. They're back and forth, in and out, learning about the synagogue. And Brandeis, uh, their kids work here. We have now a school on Tuesday afternoon and Thursday afternoon because our Sunday school is full and we don't have space in it anymore. And, um, and in addition to that, there are learning programs 
Uh, one of the things I would love for everyone to go is to go up to the JCC in the, at 11 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon and just watch the way those wonderful trainers work with seniors and work with people recovering from strokes or go into the pool, the indoor pool, and see this extensive rehab program that the JCC does with with, 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 with people who, you know, who've had strokes or arthritis or who need, you know, physical therapy of that level. There's um, the Jewish Family and Children's Services runs groups here and they see, uh, they have workers who work with seniors and families here. There's uh, uh, the great gift of having a, you know, a, a dairy vegetarian cafe next door that, that people can come and, and have a snack and schmooze. Um, the one, the, so a lot of the arts artists rehearse at the, at the JCC and there's this chamber orchestra which was founded to, and is housed here that rehearses in a, room, in a room right across from my office. So sometimes I get to sit in my office for, for a whole day and listen to this beautiful chamber music. Uh, there are kids and all the time and families and and there's something good and Jewish and substantive happening all the time. And even the things that you say, well, a gym isn't Jewish. The way sometimes the gym is run here is very Jewish because it's, 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 uh, it's part of, of a philosophy of tikkun olam. I would like to call to mind a very difficult comment that was made a few years ago in our sanctuary. Uh, it was made by one of our former rabbis, and to the slight the chagrin, maybe even embarrassment of current rabbis, when that rabbi said, you know, this temple is held together by two people, year after year. One of them, of course, was Elsie Kronitsky, and the other one is Harvey Tucker. Harvey, thank you, God bless.